Good morning. Welcome to Radcliffe Day 2016. This is a day to celebrate Radcliffe's past, present, and future. I'm Liz Cohen. I'm Dean of the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. Being here among so many of you who are celebrating reunions has reminded me that I mark a milestone of my own, my fifth year as Radcliffe Dean. <laughs> and what a whirlwind these five years have been. I have enjoyed watching our three core programs grow, our very competitive fellowship program, our exciting public lectures and conferences through academic ventures, and our renowned Schlesinger Library on the history of women in America. I've also taken great pleasure in expanding the Radcliffe Professorship Program to help Harvard schools recruit new diverse faculty talent, deepening the Institute's integration of the arts in its programming, and creating new opportunities for students to partake in advanced study beyond the standard curriculum. <clears throat> A high point of this year, as other years in the recent past, is honoring an inspiring woman with the, with the Radcliffe Medal. We lauded Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg last year and Harvard President Drew Faust in 2014, just to name two. Today, we are delighted that our Radcliffe Medalist is Janet Yellen, Chair of the Federal Reserve Board of the United States. It is our tradition to begin Radcliffe Day with a panel discussion on a topic close to our honorees' head and heart. At lunch, we will celebrate Janet Yellen's achievements, but now we will pay her the honor of digging into the subject she cares deeply about. That topic is how to build an American economy for prosperity and equality. How to promote vigorous economic growth that is broadly shared. In many ways, this past century has brought remarkable advances. In 1916, average life expectancy hovered around age 50 for both men and women in the United States. Now it is well above 70. Today, most citizens' working lives involve shorter hours and fewer life-threatening hazards than our forebears faced. Roughly 63% of us own our own homes, compared to less than half of Americans in 1916, even if today's rate is slightly lower than it was a decade ago. We all enjoy recreational and entertainment opportunities beyond our grandparents' imaginations. For many of you sitting in the audience today, <clears throat> the ability to travel to Cambridge to enjoy this panel would have been far out of reach, and watching it online would have been unfathomable. <laughs> While we mark, mark enormous societal progress, Americans' equal access to, better economic, to a better economic standard of living is shrinking. We live in an era notable for stunning growth in inequality. Right now, the world's wealthiest 62 individuals own more wealth than the bottom 50% of the entire world population. Just since 2010, the fortunes of those 62 individuals have increased by more than half a trillion dollars, while the wealth of the bottom 50% has fallen by a full trillion dollars, which constitutes a drop of 38%. The United States is by no means insulated from this global trend. According to a report by the Economic Policy Institute, since the 1970s, real wages for the top 1% have risen 362%, while real wages for most workers have stagnated. The predictable result has been increased wealth concentration at the top. In 2014, the wealthiest 20% of Americans own more than 80% of all American wealth. 
In contrast, the wealth of the poorest 20% was negative, meaning that they owed more money than the value of all of their assets put together. Despite the tendency of a whopping 87% of Americans to identify themselves as middle class, the Pew Research Center issued a report at the end of 2015 with its main findings stated clearly in the title. The report was called, The American Middle Class is Losing Ground, No Longer the Majority and Falling Behind Financially. Scholars and commentators of all political persuasions have expressed alarm. Alan Greenspan, former chair of the Federal Reserve Board appointed by President Ronald Reagan, has said publicly that current levels of inequality are, and I quote him, not the type of thing which a democratic society, a capitalist democratic society, can really accept without addressing. Elsewhere on the political spectrum, Economists and po public policy experts like Paul Krugman, Joseph Stieglitz, and Robert Putnam likewise worry that the growing chasm between haves and have-nots threatens the very foundation of American democracy. At the beginning of this year, officials from the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, along with former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright, all issued statements within days of each other, identifying inequality as a chief impediment to sustained economic growth. It wasn't always this way, even as recently as the three decades following World War II. Wearing my other hat as a 20th century US historian, I wrote a book entitled A Consumer's Republic, The Politics of Mass Consumption in Postwar America. There I showed that the postwar order that I labeled a consumer's republic was built upon an assumption that was widely shared by labor, business, and government officials that broad-based economic prosperity would benefit individuals and the nation at the same time as mass consumers protected the jobs and purchasing power of their fellow citizens. President Harry Truman made this point often. To quote directly from one of his speeches in 1950, Truman said, Raising the standards of our poorest families will not be at the expense of anybody else. We will all benefit from doing it, for the incomes of the rest of us will rise at the same time." End quote. Moreover, Truman and subsequent presidents believed that an economically secure, more equitable citizenry was capitalism's best defense against communism in the raging Cold War. So how did we get from then to now? And what can we do about it? These are the questions that our esteemed panel will consider today. The panel will be moderated by Cecilia Rouse, the Dean of the Woodrow Wilson School of Public Policy at Princeton University, where she is also the Lawrence and Shirley Katzman and Lewis and Anna Ernst Professor in the Economics of Education and a Professor of Economics and Public Affairs. She served on President Bill Clinton's National Economic Council and as a member of the White House Council of Economic Advisors under President Barack Obama. She earned her AB in Economics in 1986 and her PhD in Economics in 1992, both here at Harvard. Dean Rouse will introduce the other panelists. Please join me in warmly welcoming Dean Cecilia Rouse. Thank you very much. So good morning. It's an absolute pleasure to introduce this morning's panel, Building an Economy for Prosperity and Equality. It's quite a fitting topic for a panel convened in honor of Janet Yellen's selection as this year's Radcliffe Medalist. As you will hear throughout the day, Janet's professional life has been devoted to studying critical issues facing the macroeconomy, both through her writings as an academic scholar and through her public service, particularly in the Federal Reserve System. She's been a key player in maintaining and promoting the economic health of our country, primarily by working to find ways to maximize employment, stabilize prices, and moderate long-term interest rates through monetary <laughs> policy. However, in recent years, that task has gotten just a wee bit trickier. 
For decades, economists promoted overall economic growth with the belief that a rising tide lifts all boats. That is, that the fruits and gains from economic growth would be shared by all. This view is perhaps not surprising, since between about 1910 and 1950, wage inequality actually narrowed and then remained relatively stable until about 1980. It is pretty clear, however, that today all boats are not rising together. The past 35 years have seen tremendous economic growth, but also in an incredible rise in income and wealth inequality. From 1973 to 2005, the top one-fifth of real family income increased by about 1.6% annually, while the bottom fifth of families experienced almost no gains. In 1978, the top 0.1% 1 .1 of families held 7% of all wealth, while they held three times that much, 22% in 2012. In fact, today we have levels of inequality of, that have not been seen since the times of the robber barons over a century ago, with rather dire consequences for our economic, political, and social fabric. So the speakers on today's panel will help illuminate what we know and don't know about economic growth over the past century and how it has been shared or not. They will also highlight some of the causes for the increased inequality and perhaps, just perhaps, offer a way to address it. After giving each of our panelists a few minutes to discuss an important dimension of this issue, the panel will have a short conversation before we open it up to your questions. So let me introduce our illustrious panel. First up is David Otter, a professor and associate department chair at the MIT Department of Economics. David is a faculty research associate of the National Bureau of Economic Research and a former editor in chief of the Journal of Economic Perspectives. His current fields of specialization include human capital and earnings inequality, labor market impacts of technological change and globalization, disability insurance and labor supply, and temporary health and temporary help and other intermediated work arrangements. He received his bachelor's degree in psychology from Tufts University and a PhD in public policy from the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. Next to speak will be Louise Shainer, a senior fellow in economic studies and policy director for the Hutchins Center on Fiscal and Monetary Policy at the Brookings Institution. Prior to joining Brookings, Louis served as an economist with the Board of Government, Governors at the Federal Reserve System, most recently as the senior economist in the fiscal analysis section for the Research and Statistics Division. That said, she's also served in the Treasury Department and on the White House's Council of Economic Advisors. Louise's research focuses on health spending and other fiscal issues. She is Harvard squared, having received her PhD in economics from Harvard, as well as an undergraduate degree in, in biology from Harvard. Third, we have Claudia Golden, the Henry Lee Professor of Economics at Harvard and Director of the National Bureau of Economic Research's Development of the American Economy Program. Claudia is an economic historian and a labor economist. She has received many honors and awards that are just far too numerous to name here, so you can look her up on Google. Uh, her research has covered a wide array of topics, including slavery, the economic impact of war, the female labor force, immigration, New Deal policies, income inequality, technological change, education, and the gender gap in pay. Most of her research interprets the present through the lens of the past and explores the origins of current issues of concern. Claudia earned her bachelor's degree from Cornell University and a PhD from the University of Chicago. Last but not least, I am pleased to introduce Douglas Elmendorf, the dean of the school that I shall name here, Harvard Kennedy School of Government, <laughs> where he serves, he also serves as the Don K. Price Professor of Public Policy. Doug served as director of the Congressional Budget Office from January 2009 through March 2015. Prior to joining CBO, he served in many positions in Washington, including at the Brookings Institution, the Council of Economic Advisors, the Treasury Department, and the Federal Reserve Board. He has worked on important issues such as budget policy, health care, the macroeconomic effects of fiscal policy, social security, income security programs, financial markets, and macroeconomic analysis. Doug earned his bachelor's degree from Princeton University and his PhD from Harvard. So David, I will turn things over to you. Uh, thank you. It's an honor to be here. It's an honor to be honoring Chair Yellen. 
uh, and to be participating in the Radcliffe Institute events. Um, I want to uh, just uh, frame this discussion a bit. First, I want to talk for a moment about why should we even care about inequality. I, I don't think it's self-evident that we should. Uh, then I want to talk about uh, some of the challenges that have uh, made shared prosperity uh, a harder goal to achieve in the last uh, 40 years than in the three decades that preceded. Proceeded. And then the other panelists will fill in a much more historical detail and also uh, set the stage for how we address these issues. So first let me make the case about why should we care about inequality at all. Um, we should start off by agreeing that we need some inequality in a market economy. If we don't have inequality, we don't have incentives. Uh, we need people, if we want people to go spend you know, 10 years in medical school or uh, you know, eight years pursuing a PhD in computer science, we better reward them when they're done. And uh, so inequality uh, is, uh, is not by itself evil. In fact, it can be quite productive. The question is, um, can we have too much of it? And uh, in the short run, you could argue no. Uh, it just makes the economy dynamic. But I think in the long run, the answer is possible to be yes. And because uh, the reason uh, the answer might be yes is because we have overlapping generations of parents and children and families. And dynamism in the short run can give rise to dynasticism in the long run if we have so much concentration of income and wealth among a small group of adults that uh, the next generation of kids don't have the same opportunity to succeed. In other words, uh, equality of opportunity is one of our greatest shared values in America, something we deeply believe that people should have a good start and the opportunity to succeed on the basis of their talent and hard work. And if we start, if we, if we make the race too unequal at the outset, it's harder and harder to achieve that equality of opportunity over the long run. And that's what concerns me when I think about inequality, that we can reach a point where the economic rewards of today and the incentives are so great that the, uh, that the, uh, the prizes are so large that pretty soon inequality becomes the enemy of opportunity rather than the, uh, the force that, that uh, propels it. So now let me talk about what are the forces that have given rise to so much inequality. It's all, as was mentioned by CC, from the end of the Second World War up through the early 1970s, we had a period of extremely rapid productivity growth and shared prosperity. That period is anomalous in history. People like to say that's the way it should always be, but they're probably only the only three decades in all of human history that were quite like that. Uh, so <laughs> I'm all in favor of that if we can make that happen again. Um, but uh, that was, a, that was a, a remarkable post-war period. We'd had huge technological advances, huge advances in skills and education. Uh, and of course, the US had a leadership role in the world where it was uh, the driver of so much of what was el else was going on. Since that time, one of the first challenges we faced is actually slowing productivity growth. Uh, productivity growth is the, is the thing that ultimately creates wealth that we can distribute. When that growth slows, there's less to go around. And even our huge rise of inequality wouldn't seem so awful if all the boats were rising, but to have some people getting so rich when productivity growth is so slow means the other boats are stagnant or sinking. Um, so, and, and you can even see that if you look at the period from 1995 to around 2000, during the big internet productivity surge, that was actually a period of shared prosperity in America. That was a period when everyone's raise, wages were rising, when employment to population rates were growing, crime rates were falling, many, many good things come from that, from rapid productivity growth and also tight labor markets that push, pull wages up at the bottom. Uh, harder to, hard to accomplish, but something very much to desire. Uh, a second uh, issue that we have faced is actually slowing uh, attainment of higher education. Uh, education has been one of the keys to uh, American prosperity for more than a century. Uh, Professor Golden will speak about that. Um, but since the uh, early 1970s, we, uh, and up until recently, college attainment rates uh, slowed for men actually fell. And not only did that mean that there were fewer people benefiting from uh, getting a higher education and the earnings associated with that, but that slowing supply of higher education actually led to rising wage inequality, caused this premium to education to rise a lot. So there are actually three benefits to sending people to college. One is it makes them better off. Two is that it actually reduces inequality because as you increase the supply of more educated workers, uh, the, their wages actually come down a bit. Third, it actually benefits the workers who don't go to college because it makes them scarcer. Employers have to fight harder to get high school educated labor to do those jobs. So investment in education is one of the areas where the US has fallen short 
uh, maybe not expenditure, we spend a lot, but in actually getting people to succeed in going through college. Um, a third important factor is the forces of technological change and globalization. There's been a lot written about that. Let me just ca summarize it in a sentence or two. What those two forces collectively have done is on the one hand amplify the value of scarce talents, people who have great ideas, people who can run large corporations, people who are fantastic athletes or entertainers. They become so much more valuable in a world market where their, their skills can be delivered electronically uh, or you know, through, uh, through their products worldwide. Um, so on the one hand, it amplifies talent. On the other hand, it can also commodify labor. If you're not someone who has a scarce talent, if you're someone who just, you know, you make shoes or you sew clothes, well, you're suddenly in much fiercer competition with people throughout the rest of the world from whom we can trade and transport or even with technologies that are beginning to erode uh, or being able to accomplish that skill set. So those factors really do amplify and contribute to the growth of inequality. And then I would say the final factor is uh, a certain resignation, a view that, well, this is the market, that's what the market says, we do what the market says, uh, or, or the view that actually it's good. All that inequality, the more the better, just creates incentives. And, and I've, I've already made the argument that, in fact, you can have too much inequality. Uh, it can actually be the enemy of meritocracy, not always the friend. And, uh, and the view that, it, uh, that we have no control over it is simply incorrect. Because we can look around us and look at many other advanced economies throughout Europe, for example, or even Singapore, that have uh, uh, you know, have lower levels of inequality, not Singapore in this case, <laughs> um, but have lower levels of inequality, uh, high social cohesion, and the same productivity growth as we have. In other words, they have not suffered terribly for their, their burden of shared prosperity. Uh, and we may not either. So it, it is in, within our control. The economic forces are fundamental. We can't ignore them. Simultaneously, we actually have a lot of institutional and social and public and political choice about how we want to organize, how we want to share the benefits of our productivity and our ideas and our creativity and our hard work. So uh, there are challenges, but there's opportunity. And there's in no sense inevitable, uh, not something uh, that, that is beyond our ability to address and correct and improve. Thanks very much. Good morning. First of all, let me say what an honor it is for me to be part of, first of all, such an esteemed panel, and also to celebrate Janet Yellen, who is, I've long admired, as an extremely dedicated, brilliant, and caring academic and public servant. Okay, so Cece and David have talked a lot about income inequality, which is something that um, we have known for a long time as a problem, uh, and has been an area of great concern. But it's only in the last few years that we've begun to re recognize an additional source of growing inequality, and that's inequality in life expectancy. Okay? So it's long been the case here throughout history in the, uh, in the United States and everywhere that people who are richer live longer. Right? So that's nothing new. We've always known that. But we, for what we used to think was that um, as the economy would grow, then that growth would help to narrow the gap. So if you had improved public sanitation and public education, those things would help everybody live longer, but particularly the poor, and you'd expect sort of the gap to be narrowing. But what it turns out is, in the United States at least, that gap has actually been widening. Okay? So the first study that looked at this came from the Social Security Administration, and they took their Social Security records and they divided the population of men in two. And they looked at life expectancy and changes over time. So they started with people who were born in 1912. In people who were born in 1912, the top half of the income distribution lived about less than a year, almost a year longer than the bottom half. So the bottom half of the income distribution at 65 could expect to live almost till 80, and the top half till like 80 and a half, okay? Now fast forward 30 years later, um, we're talking about the cohort who were born in 1940, and that gap in life expectancy had widened to over five years. So now there was an over five year difference uh, at age 65 in how long the top half of the income distribution lived relative to the bottom. And that came because the bottom half of the income dis distribution did have increases in life expectancy, but only about one and a half years. Whereas the top half of the income distribution had had increases in ex life expectancy of about six years. 
Okay. Um, now, many other recent studies, you might have heard about a study from Raj Chetty and co-authors using incredibly rich tax data, have found the same thing recently, which is that those in the bottom um, of the income distribution have gained very little in life expectancy, while those at the top have experienced major improvements. Um, a study that came out from a panel that I was on at the National Academy of Sciences said, well, what happens if these trends continue? So if these trends continue, we take the cohort born in 1960, basically my cohort, and say, let's now compare, we used quintiles, so let's compare 20% of the population. So let's compare the bottom 20% to the top 20% of the population and see what changes in life expectancy will be. And what we found is that if these trends continue, we can expect the bottom top 20% to live 13 years less um, from age on than the top half than the top 20%, okay? So an extremely big difference in how many uh, years um, people are living. So think about it, not only have we had income inequality, wage stagnation at the bottom, but also changes in life expectancy, okay? And when we talk about life expectancy, that's because e it's easy to measure, we know when people die. But it's not just that we're all equally healthy and just sort of, you know, die at different ages. We know that, you know, if life expectancy is um, so widely different, then so is health. Right? In fact, uh, health economists to sort of think the better measure of your age is not how many years you since your birth, but, since, but before you die. That's going to tell you how healthy you are. So people at the bottom of the head, little income, poor, n n little improvement in health, little improvement in life expectancy, you know, and no wonder there is so much anger out there, okay? Very big difference. Um, you've probably heard about um, a recent study by Anne Case and Angus Deaton, who won the Nobel Prize in Economics, and they looked at something quite similar. They looked at death rates um, from 2000 to 2014 for people 45 to 55. And usually we think that over time death rates decline, life expectancy increases because we're all getting richer and we have better medicine and better technology. But what they found was actually an increase in death rates for 45 to 55 year olds, particularly those without a, white males without a high school education, okay? And where did those death rates come from? They could look at the causes. Well, they came from things like increased suicide, alcoholism, and drug addiction, okay? So it's sort of a very concrete example of the despair that's out there. Now, how does this relate to income inequality? The truth is we're not really sure. Is it the same thing? Is it just another manifestation? So some people think it's actually the income inequality that is creating the life expectancy inequality. That could come because, so people at the top of the distribution, they're still at the top 20%, but they have so much more money than they used to relative to the bottom, and maybe they're able to use that money to buy things that increase their lifespan. It's possible that just living in such an unequal society uh, creates a lot of stresses and strains that affect health. Um, and it's possible that now, sorry, that now income can now buy things that it couldn't buy that will help increase your life expectancy, so it's possible. It, the causality could also be the reverse. It could be that we've had health inequality, um, maybe coming from different things in childhood, and the health inequality leads to income inequality because people who are not in good health, particularly mental health, are not gonna end up working and making a lot of money. So um, that's a possibility. And it's also possible that it's all coming from some other factor, you know, something like education, the quality of education, or the skills that people are learning um, when they're young. There are skills like perseverance and self-control and discipline that can help uh, affect both your income and your health, right? So we don't really know. Uh, one thing that we do know is part of the change is, is smoking. Um, so we know that the high-income people started smoking first and quit smoking first. Um, and that, but researchers say that can explain maybe 20 to 30% of the widening gap in life expectancy. But it, so this is a clearly huge issue and we need to know more about it and understand more about it. Um, but in any case, it seems like um, any measures that we can take that would likely reduce income inequality would probably have a benefit um, on uh, life expectancy and equality as well, particularly things that are like investment in children, uh, improvements in education, because we know that education and health are actually quite correlated and there's evidence that's actually causal that the more educated people take measures that improve their health. Um, so um, let me just uh, say, so the gap in life expectancy is something that we need to deal with. It affects how we think about um, sort of society in general, and also how we think about um, programs like Social Security and Medicare, um, because we think of those programs as progressive programs, um, because the people uh, at the lower end of the income distribution get a better deal from Social Security and Medicare than people at the top. But to the extent that you know, we, these programs are programs that pay out for every year that you're alive, so widening um, disparity in life expectancy is also meaning there's widening disparity in the returns that people are getting from programs like Social Security and Medicare. And so when we start to think about how to reform those programs, which we will be doing over the next you know, 10 to 15 years, it's something to keep in mind. 
But I think that's actually second order. I mean, the way I think about the increase in life expectancy is a really concrete uh, example of what's happening to our society. You know, we can argue about what's happening to wages at the bottom and whether or not we're measuring it right, but we know we're measuring life expectancy. Um, and so I think it should serve as a clarion call to say we really need to do something about that. Thank you. Greetings. So one of the nice things, one of the many nice things about being a historian and an economist is that I can do really great backcasting. <laughs> and I get it right almost every time. <laughs> so I want to tell you a story. And it's a story about a bold investment that the US made in the early part of the 20th century. And the investment was made locally and at the state level and not nationally by and large. And it reflected a commitment on the part of most Americans to provide education to its youth, although the South and African Americans in many regions are sad exceptions to my story. So it was this investment that led to a great narrowing of the income distribution and it is the slowing down of these educational investments, and David remarked about that, that produced much of the widening of the income distribution. So I'm going to have a few caveats at the end of my remarks about the top 1%. But right now, let's say that my remarks are going to be about the bottom 99%. That is a pretty big group. So from the end of World War II to around the late 1970s, America grew together. Economic growth, as we've heard from others, was largely shared, and it was, moreover, rather strong in an exceptional period. The bottom fifth of families in that period experienced income growth that was actually a bit greater than that of the top fifth. And the middle group had growth in, believe it or not, the 2.5% range average annually. So everyone was doing better, and they were doing better at each part of the distribution. But after the late 1970s, America began to grow apart, and growth was fairly anemic. The top 5% grew, yes, at more than 2% average annually, but the lowest fifth hardly grew at all. So how did the US once manage to have economic growth with equity? And the answer must be sought, actually, in the late 19th century, when incomes had become extremely unequal. America, in even earlier times, was known by de Tocqueville and others as the best poor man's country. If you were poor in Europe and you came here, you would do much better. But it had become a place of robber barons in the Gilded Age and a land of rising and high inequality. Discontent was intense, and it gave rise to many third-party movements, populists, socialists, and rampant anti-immigration sentiment. Sound familiar? The returns to a high school degree in 1900 were very high. And even ordinary clerks and bookkeepers made substantial incomes. Part of rising inequality came from an increased demand for skills that could be provided in schools. That is what we now term skill-biased technical change. In community after community in the US, there was a groundswell for publicly funded high schools. And thus was born what they called, and we historians call, the high school movement. In 1910, as this movement began to take off, European visitors scoffed the American notion of educating its masses. And they maintained an elite but actually quite excellent education that admitted only the brightest at 11 years old. Americans were far more egalitarian. 
By the eve of World War II, the median 18-year-old male in the US was a high school graduate poised to go to college. The US GI Bill in 1944 guaranteed a college education to returning GIs, but a similar bill in Britain could guarantee only schooling to age 15. The US had made a bold move, later copied by uh, most others. The US did the right thing in expanding high schools at that period and then college. Mistakes were made along the way that we live with now regarding standards and excellence. But this isn't the time to discuss those. The question before us is how we know when major investments are worth undertaking, when many of the returns accrue much, much later, if at all. In the early years of the high school movement, the returns to a year of school were very high. It was palpable, it was known, even for that marginal student. Employers were searching for workers with the skills that high school educated youths had. Even without any of the other benefits that accrue with more education, such as benefits regarding health, for example, the investment seemed worth the foregone income and the direct costs. The same can be said of college today. Well-identified estimates indicate that even the marginal student has significant gains to most types of post-secondary education. When I first wrote that, I said to post-secondary education, and then I remembered my own work on for-profit higher education. So I said most types of <laughs> post-secondary education. So I will conclude, but before I do, I need to go back and say something about that top 1%. Growth for the top 1% has been enormous in the past 35 years, increasing uh, total income, their total income from 10% to 21% in that 35 year period. But in terms of annual income, the increased value of a college education is about three times larger. And that is a very complicated calculation that I cannot say because I don't have time and you don't want to hear it, okay? <laughs> So in conclusion, can we have growth with equity again? The issue of growth is the hardest part. Equity may be easier. Thanks. Thank you. I am delighted to be here for Radcliffe Day and honored to be included in this celebration of Janet Yellen. I will use my few minutes to draw out some implications of the other panelists' remarks for fiscal policy and monetary policy, two areas in which Janet has, of course, played very important roles. Also, as it turns out, two areas in which I have had the privilege of working for Janet. I was a staff economist at the Federal Reserve Board in the mid-1990s when she was the governor. And then I was on the staff of the President's Council of Economic Advisors in the late 1990s when Janet was the chair. And if I'd been really smart, I would have kept following her around after that <laughs> because I would have kept learning a lot more, but other, other jobs intruded. Uh, what I want to do now is to highlight uh, three areas of fiscal policy, and I'll focus on federal fiscal policy, uh, where I think fiscal policy can play an important role in helping to generate inclusive economic growth. And then I'll highlight one recommendation for monetary policy. For fiscal policy, first and foremost, we should increase investments in education and training. Under the current caps on annual appropriations, federal investments of all sorts for infrastructure, for research and development, and for education and training will soon fall to their smallest share of GDP in at least 50 years. That is not forward-looking, growth-oriented economic policy, and is particularly unfortunate for people who are growing up in poor families or in areas with low average income 
uh, because those people cannot rely on their families or their communities to provide high quality education and training. Uh, federal support directed in the right way can make a substantial difference. Now, the money is not a panacea. As David noted, uh, we don't spend all of our education dollars wisely, current location accepted. <laughs> uh, but studies show that when additional money is given to poor school districts, for example, the students in those districts do better. So there are a lot of steps to making our education and training in this country more effective. But a simple starting point is to increase federal support for it, those issues, not to cut it. Increasing federal investment is especially appropriate now because uh, market interest rates that the Treasury pays uh, are so low and will probably stay low for some time. Uh, and in research that Louise and I are doing together, we show that low interest rates generally imply, as one might expect, that the federal government should in fact, issue more debt and undertake more investment than it would under other conditions. A second way in which federal fiscal policy should help to generate inclusive economic growth is to maintain benefits for lower and middle income people rather than cutting them as part of some deficit reduction effort or for other purposes. Federal benefits, uh, transfer benefits in general, play two crucial roles. One role is to help children growing up in families of modest means get a stronger start. A small but growing body of evidence shows that federal subsidies for health care, for housing, for education, and for other things helps children earn higher incomes later in their lives. So in many respects, those federal benefits are a true investment. But benefits also matter because they protect people to some extent from the vicissitudes of market forces. As a number of the panelists have, have said, uh, incomes for people on the lower and middle parts of the distribution have grown uh, very slowly uh, over the past few decades. But those are market incomes. If one then incorporates the effects of transfers and taxes, incomes on the lower and middle parts of the distribution uh, have done much better, not super well but much better than they would have. So that the tax and transfer system has limited uh, the extent of uh, widening in standards of living in the face of this very sharp widening in pre-tax, pre-transfer incomes. Moreover, the tax and transfer system pays a, plays a very important role during economic downturns. In this last downturn, market incomes for people in the lower and middle parts of the distribution fell markedly but their incomes after tax and transfers are incorporated uh, were much more stable. So these benefits play absolutely crucial roles, both in laying the groundwork for future more equal growth in market incomes and for protecting people from a divergence of market incomes in economic downturns or even over a period of several decades. A third way in which federal fiscal policy should be used to help generate inclusive economic growth is to keep the total demand for goods and services high enough that we achieve full employment. Full employment is tremendously important for both economic and social reasons. Tight labor markets that draw people into the labor force and they push up the growth of wages. And those factors are especially important for lower income people who are more likely to lose their jobs when labor demand is weak and who have less resources to fall back on uh, when they do lose their jobs. So full employment uh, allows for more income for people who need it. It also fulfills our social commitment to have an economy in which willing workers can find work. Unfortunately, maintaining full employment is likely to be quite difficult in the coming years. In each of the past three recessions, the Federal Reserve has cut the federal funds rate by more than five percentage points. But with market interest rates so low, they are very unlikely to have that much room to cut when the next recession arrives. That means that counter-cyclical fiscal policy, cuts in taxes or increases in federal spending when the economy uh, weakens, will be more important in the coming decades than it was in the 1970s and 1980s and 1990s. We should be strengthening our automatic fiscal stabilizers and developing a set of policies additionally that we could put into place if needed. 
a rush to reduce budget deficits uh, after 2010 was the biggest error in economic policy uh, in this downturn in this country. And we should not make that mistake again. My last and shortest point is about monetary policy. To help generate inclusive economic growth, the Federal Reserve should continue to focus on both uh, maximum employment and on stable prices, the two parts of its so-called dual mandate. To be sure, monetary policy cannot achieve full employment on its own in most cases because of both the longstanding reason that structural problems can be important in labor markets uh, and for the new reason that the Federal Reserve will have less scope to cut rates in the future. But saying that the Federal Reserve cannot achieve full employment uh, on its own or cannot achieve it just by reducing the federal funds rate does not let the Federal Reserve off the hook in what it needs to do. Um, since the financial crisis, under the leadership of Ben Bernanke and Janet Yellen, the Federal Reserve has developed creative ways to accomplish uh, the mandates that have been set for it in law of maximum employment and price stability. We should be very grateful uh, that they had the wisdom and the analytic skill to develop these new tools, and we should expect them to use those tools again when future conditions warrant. Thank you very much. So I'm going to ask the panel um, a question or two, uh, but I believe you have cards in your folders, and so you can take this time to write questions. That's what those cards are for, and I think there are individuals here to whom you can pass those cards, and that's how we'll be doing the Q&A. Um, so I wanted to make sure I made that announcement. Okay. So one topic that's been fairly hot in the presidential uh, election so far, the campaign, uh, is um, international trade and its responsibility in possibly increasing income inequality. None of you mentioned it. I was wondering if anybody, or maybe you did, David. <laughs> okay. But I was just wondering if you could say a little bit more of what has been the role of trade, what should be the role of trade, especially as we are becoming a more globalized economy. Uh, sure. This, this is something I've, I've worked on a lot. and. Uh, Trade has always been a contentious economic topic, and uh, the debate around uh, the uh, trade in, in the political circle has always been kind of uh, bipolar. On the one hand, you have uh, folks on the left saying, uh, trade is good if we export more than we import, because uh, we win, uh, and otherwise it's bad uh, if we import more than we export, that we lose. And then on the, on the other side, trade uh, promoters say, trade is good, Everyone benefits, it's a win-win. Neither of those views is accurate. Economists have always understood that trade promotes economic growth, whether you have trade deficits or trade surpluses, but it's also redistributive. In general, it creates uh, diffuse beneficiaries by lowering the prices of goods and services, and it creates concentrated losses among workers in import competing sectors. Uh, historically, we've known that, but we haven't seen it so much. In the last 20 years, we've really seen it. Uh, China's rise as an extremely productive, competitive, uh, international uh, manufacturing superpower has been very good for China, very good for, most, for the world, and good for the US in many ways. But it's also been extremely disruptive uh, for import competing sectors, for manufacturers of shoes and textiles and leather goods and toys and electronic assembly literally resulting in the reduction of millions on the order of about a million U.S. manufacturing jobs during the decade starting around 2001. And we can see that. You can look at places where furniture was made, where shoes were made, uh, where uh, uh, assembly was done, and you can see those jobs. Not only do you see employment decline, but you see broader economic malaise. You don't see workers costlessly reallocating into new activities. And this has been... Uh, economically painful and also politically consequential. And in fact, you can see that in the areas that were most impacted by this trade exposure, we see uh, growth of uh, polarized politics uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the kind of uh, more uh, white non-Hispanic uh, Republican areas. It's led to uh, the rise of the Tea Party. In actually in left-leaning and 
uh, minority intensive locations, it's led to uh, more, more uh, strong left-wing politicians. So, I'm sorry, I'm going on too long. Let me just conclude. Um, there, there is a, uh, there actually is an economic origin for this debate that is bubbling up in the current presidential election, but I actually think it's healthy in the following sense. There's now greater understanding and recognition on both sides of the aisle that trade has costs and, sorry, that has benefits and costs, that it's not a win-win. We have always known that as economists. Now we can recognize that as politicians, and hopefully we can have trade policy that both recognizes the benefits of, of globalization and spreads those benefits and compensates the individuals who uh, bear the brunt of it. Now, I just want to add, this is on, I just want to add to David's points, a very simple point, which is that he talked about trades and goods, and uh, immigration is also, uh, we could say the same things that David said in talking about immigration as well. Um, so I, I didn't fully hear what we should do about it because in every trade agreement there is an attempt to compensate the losers uh, that ends up because everybody worries, sure, we know the losers are those who lose their jobs, but it can't be that all job loss is related to the trade agreement. So we tend to write the eligibility rules very tightly so that a small fraction of people who might ultimately have been affected. So I would, I'm going to push back with you a little, David, and, and ask you really how should, you know, we see this polarization. It is a challenge for whoever is going to be in the White House next. Sure. What really should they be doing differently? Well, trade is not a bogeyman. There are lots of economic forces that are disruptive. Immigration is one, technological change is If I'm replaced by a machine as opposed to a foreign worker, I'm, I'm out of a job. So I actually don't think we should try to make Trade, uh, the trade adjustment narrowly tailored. It sh you shouldn't have to prove that in a world without trade you wouldn't have lost your job, in a world with technology you would have. Uh, we should have adjustment. We should allow, we should uh, facilitate people whose skills become obsolete or her industry is closed, closed down to make investments in skills or to help them ensure their earnings losses, at least temporarily, as they move across sectors. That, you don't need trade adjustment for that. We could actually make the earned income tax credit an earner's credit that wasn't dependent upon having young dependent children uh, to access that and uh, get higher earnings in, in uh, not particularly high wage jobs. So I think there's a broader answer to that that's not trade specific. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. Well, yeah, so I just want to add to that. So I think, I think that that's sort of one of the things that we're finding is that we've had a um, policy that worries more about incentives and we don't want to put bad incentives in that people won't work or whatever. And, and so we don't do things that would help people. Um, and I think what we're realizing is that those have social consequences. It has consequences for the children and the families. Um, and that maybe just in terms of the weights that we're putting on, you know, of things that we typically think of pro-growth as low taxes and trade, um, that there are costs that maybe we're starting to recognize are bigger than we thought. I would, I'll just add the, I agree with everything that other people have said. I would just add that I think we tend to talk in this country about the importance of overall economic growth. And for many people, they leave the distributional issues aside. They're somewhat uncomfortable to talk about. They can have a feel of setting people against each other. But that logic, that focus on overall growth, worked best during a period when the rising tide really did lift all boats. And if the rising tide is not going to lift all boats, and it has not lifted all boats uh, over the past several decades, then we just need to be more explicit about our distributional concerns, if we have them. And I, um, and I think it is crucially, my view is those concerns are crucially important for uh, sustaining the social cohesion that the country depends on. And that's important for setting future economic policy. It's important for the country's leadership in the world. It's important for the way we tackle social issues in this country. A sense of people that they're not together, that they are apart, uh, is a very big problem uh, for us and not what I think many of us think of as the American way. But to change that, we really have to do significant things to help people who are being left behind, whether because of trade or because of technological change or something else. Um, so, uh, so many of you have argued for increased investments in infrastructure, I hear infrastructure, R&D, education. And how do we ensure, how do we ensure that those investments are effective? So, you know, we all worry about investments in the bridge to nowhere, 
I think there might have been a New York Times article about an infrastructure investment uh, that was full of graft. So how do we make these, you know, so if we're going to be increasing these investments, how do we ensure that they're going to the right people, places, things? <laughs> Please. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Um, so that's obviously very difficult. Um, I think we have had a move towards evidence-based policy where people are trying to actually think quite carefully about what, what investments do make sense, what investments don't make sense. Um, you know, people say, oh, we should have high-speed rail, but maybe that doesn't necessarily make sense for the United States. And so, you know, you don't want to just do uh, investments without thinking carefully about it. Now, the political process gets in the way, and that's where the bridge to nowhere problem comes is because if you're going to spend in one place that it makes sense, well, everybody needs theirs. And and so then you end up spending in lots of places, and so that's an issue. Um, but you know, if you think about Doug's point about rates of return and the interest rates now, you know, we can afford to make investments that have less than ideal uh, returns. Not as not you know, they're not going to be perfect. It's going to have to go through that pol political process, and you're going to end up having things that you don't uh, want. On the other hand, interest rates are very low, so we don't need to have huge rates of return to make it matter. And to the extent that these investments now have greater social return than we thought before, right? We think these problems are bigger than we thought. We realize that social cohesion is really, really important. You know, then you're willing to put the money for, you know, to, for the hope because you think it has higher returns when it does sort of hit the right places. And so some of it may not hit the right places, but still it's kind of the direction that we want to go in. And I'd say, like, I think we've had a bias towards thinking that, well, we always want to lower taxes and taxes clearly raise economic growth, but the evidence on that is pretty murky as well. Um, and so I think that, you know, if we think this is a big problem, we want to try to be smart about how we make the investments, but still realize that we're going to have to keep trying stuff uh, until we get what works, because we can't just say, well, nothing works, so we're just going to ignore the problem. Can, can I just add, um, as the dean of a school of government and a longtime public servant, I think we need to find ways to make public service more attractive, more appealing to more of the best and brightest young people. Oh, I support that. <laughs> uh, I've, 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 I've worked, as Louise has and Cece has and others, with some terrifically smart, talented, dedicated people in the federal government. Um, but it worries me when I see the survey of Harvard College graduates and 50-some percent are going into finance-related things. I have nothing against that, but 3 percent, I think, uh, we're going into public service, and that worries me a lot. We need more public service recruiters here. <laughs> That's part of it. But let me add to this uh, important conversation that at least in uh, higher education, it's not so much increasing the amount, but doing something to stem the fact that our public colleges and universities, community colleges in particular, uh, have lost so much. So it's not as if we're adding and building bridges to nowhere. Uh, really important bridges have been taken down. So I've already got a set of questions. So I think why don't we move uh, to some questions. So. Um, Apparently, a few of you have asked, how uh, does gender and working women affect income distrib the income distribution? Oh, wow. <laughs> Claudia, I think that would be for you. <laughs> oh, <that one. laughs> a pretty complicated question. <laughs> women are the most interesting, quote, minority, <laughs> because <laughs> we are everywhere, OK? <laughs> We, we are not segregated by housing, for example. Um, so one way that this affects the income distribution is that we've had greater what we call positive assortative mating over time, which is a wonderful term uh, for Harvard graduates, marry Harvard graduates. <laughs> OK. That's fun. So <laughs> what, what makes that important in terms of the income distribution is that it adds a little bit of a multiplier that we've seen um, increases, tremendous increases to the returns to college. And if you have even more 
positive assorted of mating, it means that it in fact even to some degree widens uh, these gaps. So if we're thinking about it in the aggregate, that's one way of thinking about it. On the other hand, if we think about women as a separate group, which I said at the beginning is sort of impossible to do, uh, we have a set of important issues that relate to the ones that have been raised about don't forget the children, okay? The children are very important. And so having a work environment uh, in which, which is highly inflexible means that women either forego their careers uh, to give to their children or their children are left often alone being let out of school at 2.30 let out of school in June, we've inherited institutions from a very distant past. So I see two issues here, one concerning aggregate income inequalities and the other one wrapped up in issues concerning the family and women's special role in that. Great, thank you. David. Okay. Um, so Louise, I want to one to you because I, I think this is important. How do we approach disparities in healthcare in the setting of continued rise in costs? Huh. So that is clearly a big issue. Um, we have, of course, just uh, uh, passed the Affordable Care Act a few years ago, which uh, is going to make major differences in access to care, and it already is. Um, and costs are something that the federal government has to think carefully about. It's actually not such an easy question as well. I mean, one of the things that as we do get richer as a society, we tend to value health care a lot more than we used to. And so um, although it's a huge budget buster when health care spending keeps going up and it makes it hard to do the kind of redistribution that we like, um, you know, there's also a trade-off, which is something that people... Uh, really like. It used to be actually maybe 10 or 15 years ago you would go to a health care conference on health spending and they'd say how many of you would, you know, would be rather have 1980s health care at 1980s prices and a lot of people would raise their hand and I think that that's not even lo no longer true. People will say, you know, they recognize that they really, uh, although it's too expensive, they really want, you know, today's health care. And so then the question for policy is whether or not um, w one, we can keep doing that or want to do that. At some point, we're going to want to spend our money on something else. Um, or, the, or whether or not, you know, we don't need to necessarily slow technology down, but there's just tremendous waste in the healthcare system. So the Affordable Care Act actually had a lot of um, very innovative new payment models that hopefully will at least slow the growth rate of healthcare over time, um, but trying to make it more efficient. Um, you know, the evidence, we don't know exactly what's going to happen. Healthcare spending has slowed tremendously, actually, um, in the past uh, few years, uh, at least six years now, um, and how much of that is just this temporary pause uh, versus how much of that is something that's just going to, you know, is still kind of a, a relic of the uh, Great Recession is still unclear. But, um, you know, clearly we want to, the more we spend on healthcare, the more important it is that we spend our dollars wisely and don't waste it. Um, and so I think that will be something uh, that public policy continues to work at. I'm going to combine two questions. Um, so, uh, from the from labor for labor comps, we think of these as institutional factors that affect inequality. Which is, what are the impact of the minimum wage and unions on the income distribution? Would anybody like to talk about that? Sure, I'll, I'll take that on. <laughs> uh, so. We, you know, the, 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 both unions and the minimum wage have been two of our most important labor market institutions for moderating inequality and affecting distribution. Uh, both of them have been in decline. Uh, labor unions, subs uh, at this point, about 7% of the private sector workforce uh, belongs to a union, uh, and that's down from uh, uh, more than 30% on the eve of World War II. Um, the minimum wage is also at a considerably lower real level than it, it has been in quite some time. It's risen recently, but if we compare it to the level, for example, that it was in 1977, and we index that to inflation, it would be about $20 an hour right now. Um, I, I think uh, the, uh, we need to seek new labor market institutions, actually, that can address the roles that have formerly been played. I, I do not foresee a growth of private sector unionization uh, that will replace, uh, that, that will reverse that trend enormously. Uh, and so 
Uh, but that, that, that's not intrinsically a bad thing because labor unions had positives and negatives. Uh, they were exclusive. In some cases, they were exclusive. They, uh, they didn't, were not benefiting minority workers or not benefiting women, and you had to belong to a certain company in a certain sector. Um, I would like to see, and I think we're actually moving in this direction, of, of a broader set of uh, institutions that affect the quality of work, they affect the quality of economic security, whether that's through providing health care, not just through employment, but uh, generally through a, a public, uh, public provision. Having labor standards, for example, the change in the overtime rules that the Obama administration has just enacted. Uh, providing, making provision for, uh, for maternal and paternal leave uh, for uh, some degree of, uh, of uh, uh, ability to uh, leave work for health, health and family reasons. So I think there's a way we can make these institutions uh, more broadly accessible uh, and, uh, and, and, and share their benefits more broadly. On the minimum wage specifically, I think most uh, economists are divided. Uh, some would say the minimum wage is just fine. Others would say it's quite destructive of work. Um, I think all would agree that it's not our favorite way of raising earnings. It's not the best tool we have. Uh, better tools include the earned income tax credit that actually incentivizes work without it costing employers. Uh, and uh, other things that raise productivity or even affect the quality of jobs. For example, not allowing employers to schedule people for work two hours before their shift begins. The minimum wage in moderation. Uh, it does not appear to have particularly adverse consequences and clearly has some benefits as well. Uh, in the range that we've seen it in the last 30 years. If we start raising to $22 an hour and did so suddenly, I think we would see some of the downside costs as well. So it's, it's one of the arrows in our quiver, but, but probably not the, most, uh, the, best, the best arrow. Would anybody else like to comment? No? OK. Um, so um, I think many of you have advocated uh, for addressing both increasing growth and inequality with uh, let's just put it out there, more spending. Uh, so are you at all concerned about the budget deficit long term? If not, why not? If so, how would you reduce the deficit without further widening the gap in income inequality? Maybe I'll just start with that one. Yeah, go ahead, Doug. <laughs> um, so I do worry about the budget, the federal budget deficit and debt uh, in the long term. I worry about it quite a bit. Uh, the federal budget is on an unsustainable path uh, because uh, spending will outpace revenues by increasing amounts over time, pushing up federal debt relative to the size of our economy, and that is not sustainable indefinitely. So something must be done. Now the question is what uh, and how quickly. Uh, and uh, my own uh, view uh, about what we should do is informed by the perspective I offered earlier, uh, I think that given the patterns of income growth in this country over the past several decades, that the primary goal of our economic policy today should be to raise incomes for lower and middle income people. And if you take that perspective uh, and take it seriously, then that guides you to doing and not doing certain things uh, in pursuit of more sustainable fiscal policy. So from my perspective, given that objective, uh, I would not uh, cut benefits or uh, raise taxes on people of modest means. I would focus the, at least focus the changes on uh, people who have done better over the past several decades. Uh, so I would cut benefits uh, in Social Security uh, and I would raise premiums, income related premiums in Medicare, but I would focus those changes on the uh, upper part of the income distribution. And to be clear about upper, <laughs> Um, I don't mean, uh, just before you applaud, <laughs> uh, I, I don't mean just Bill Gates, right? So there's a tendency in discussions of this to say that's always somebody else. So I would say the top third or, or maybe even the top half of the income distribution, I would make some changes in those benefits, okay? <laughs> Slightly less applause, but that's okay. <laughs> um, uh, and on the tax side, I would, I, I would, I think there's no doubt that the federal government will end up collecting uh, significantly more in tax revenue uh, 10, 20 years from now than is scheduled under current law. Because I think, in fact, when you get down to specific elements of federal spending uh, that are of any consequence relative to the size of the federal budget and the size of the economy, most people like most parts of them, even if in the abstract they're against uh, high federal spending and would like less. So I think revenue will go up and the uh, 
trick there is to tax things that are, uh, we're less worried about discouraging, right? The problem with, with higher tax rates is it can discourage work, it can discourage saving. Um, one thing we'd like to discourage is carbon emissions. Uh, so we should put a price on carbon through a carbon tax or a cap and trade system. And um, I never get this, really. This is interesting. <laughs> and usually the budget guy gets nothing but booze. Um, and also, um, on, in the uh, individual and business tax codes, uh, I would uh, personally sweep out a significant portion of the deductions and credits and so on, and I would not take all of the extra revenue gained and plow it back into rate reductions. I would keep it uh, to increase overall federal revenues. So I think it is possible to make changes that put the federal budget on a sustainable trajectory uh, without undermining the, the goal of inclusive economic growth. Um, the one thing I'll say about timing is I, I think the fact that interest rates uh, the Treasury borrowing rates are extraordinarily low now by historical standards and are very widely expected to stay low for a considerable period of time makes this challenge less urgent. But it is important to start the policies that we would like to change soon because almost undoubtedly we would like those policies to phase in very slowly. So it's not crucial to make next year's deficit smaller or the following year's deficit smaller or the year after that's deficit smaller. But it is important to be having policies that will have a real effects uh, 10 years from now. And many of those are policies that we should be legislating uh, and building in adjustment paths for now. Does anybody else want to comment, Doug? Um, three well, cheers for tax increases. Three cheers for tax increases. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm gonna combine two questions they may be related, maybe not, but I'm just going to put them together. So one is that it seems technological gains will decrease the need for workers if that results in fewer jobs uh, than potential employees. How can we as a so society deal with large numbers of people who do not need to be employed? And how would we put that into a new economy thinking about the gig economy and other forms of employment relationships? Uh, David. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. David's uh, gig let me, let me start with the gig economy. Um, the gig economy, I think, actually uh, exemplifies, at least in my thinking, the, the point I was making uh, earlier about commodification uh, versus amplification. And you see both going on. So uh, the, uh, if you're, uh, let's say, you're the, the software equivalent of a movie star, Right? Then the gig economy is a great thing for you because you can, you know, rather than being insulated inside of one firm where you get a pretty good salary, you can sell your, your services to the market, to the highest bidder. And, uh, and the gig economy makes that easy, easy to dis for people to discover, discover your talent, to contract with you. And so uh, it provides, it amplifies, it, you, you, uh, your talents are now going to be more richly rewarded. At the same time, if you're a vehicle driver or you're a plumber or you're a person who goes to the grocery store to buy groceries for other people, you are now kind of a commodity labor on tap. Um, and so in, in some, for some individuals, that could actually be uh, less attractive, although not an option. So for example, you know, I, I was recently at a, a conference and I heard people uh, in the trades complaining that rather than them having their own differentiated firms, they were now basically you know, a service provided by Amazon. You tell Amazon what you want, Amazon calls them up, sends them out, you never deal with them again. They weren't happy about that model. Uh, so that's the commodification side. And I think um, we need to recognize that they're both they're gain costs and benefits. On the one side, there's flexibility. And if you're a worker, if you're an Uber driver, you can turn on your, your Uber app when you want to and shut it off when you don't want to use it. And that's great. Um, on the other hand, people also have a, deme a need for economic security. And flexibility, when I get to choose, is great. Flexibility meaning I work when the market wants me to, and I don't work if the market doesn't want me to, that's not the kind of flexibility I'm looking for. Uh, so uh, I think this ties into this point about what are the labor market institutions that make, that create economic security even when there's rapid change. And they are things having to do with health care, good education, and things that provide uh, a, a basic wraparound set of social services that allow people to prosper even in uh, challenging times. Talking more broadly and briefly <laughs> uh, about you know where will the jobs come from, we don't know, but we have been worried about uh, the effect, effect of automation on employment for more than two centuries. Uh, this is not did not start uh, with uh, with Amazon, and um, and in general we've been impressed by how 
uh, our ability to think of new things to do. So in the beginning of the 20th century, about 38% of US workers were employed on farms. Uh, if a economist from the 21st century had showed up on the farm and said, hey, guess what, you guys? Uh, in 100 years, there'll only be 2% of you working in agriculture. So what do you think the other 36% will do? Uh, they would have not, they probably wouldn't have said, oh, you know, software, uh, personal <laughs> services, <laughs> apps. It's all going to be apps. Uh, and, and yet, uh, you know, we have, we, th we, we underestimate our own creativity and ingenuity and also our ability to consume new stuff. People, as we get wealthier, our demand for consumption rises. If people in, in 2016 want to have the standard of living of people in 1916, they could do so by working about 17 hours a week on average. Uh, but most people don't choose to. They would rather continue to work hard and then play hard, so to speak. So uh, technological change will be disruptive, but remember it's disruption that comes from productivity improvements. That's a, that's a good problem to have, right? Most economic problems are problems of scarcity, not problems of abundance. So if we really are getting that much more productive through technological change, it will create challenges, but also gives us additional wealth to deal with those challenges. Let, let me add that uh, we have, in the period that David was talking about, worked far fewer hours per day and per week. So we've taken our gains in several, on several margins, several dimensions. So we have more goods, more services, uh, longer lifetimes, better quality years, and we also work, we do work um, fewer hours per week than um, 100 years ago or whatever. Uh, I'm reminded as well that um, there's a, a large literature. There was a play called RUR in the 1920s. So we have lived in fear that the robots are going to take us over, that the androids are going to be doing everything, that you won't know when you get married whether you marry to an android or not. Okay. Uh, uh, this hasn't happened. So, and we, as, as I know of. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, as David has said, these have been concerns for uh, a very long time. There have been lots of questions about immigration and um, how to think about the impact of immigration on both growth, economic growth, and on income inequality. And how should we think about that relative to full employment? David? <laughs> anybody? Anybody? <laughs> What you <laughs> said before about trade, but just put in immigration. <laughs> yeah. I, I, immigration is is an area where we actually the theory is not that dissimilar from trade. We understand that it should have distributional consequences. It creates growth. Uh, and uh, it, it, it expands the size of the economy in general. It should be a good thing. It reduces scarcity. Um, the, the evidence is actually much less conclusive than you would expect. Uh, there is really, uh, despite a strong popular sentiment and, and really, you know, even firsthand observation, economists have not found strong evidence that even uh, rapid expansions of low education immigration has greatly depressed wages or employment of low educated Americans. And that's very surprising. Um, but uh, we, because it, it would be plausible for that to occur, the, uh, the, re the typical or the standard rac rationalization of that is they complement each other. They don't just substitute each other. Typically, immigrants do slightly different jobs from natives, and you actually see natives moving across the occupational distribution as that occurs. But it, you can understand why it, it's contentious, because you are introducing competing groups, especially in the low-skill labor market, where labor is much more commodified. Um, in the high-skill labor market, um, uh, I, I think many of us would feel very strong that we should be uh, increasing high-skilled immigration, that one of the U.S.'s greatest strengths uh, is that we attract talented people from all over the world. They come here to be at places just like this, uh, and they tend to stick around, and they produce great ideas, they enrich our culture, uh, and uh, they are have been central to our growth and prosperity and really the, the, uh, the fountainhead of so much of uh, greatness has occurred here. So, and you could... Hoping I get one of those. The, uh, <laughs> I, and you can make the counter argument, well, don't they compete with high-skilled workers in America as well? Yes, 
but high skill workers in America are doing great. So we can stand the competition, I think. Okay. Uh, so hope we'll, we'll uh, thank you. Let me just say one other point, which is that in an economy with an aging population and fertility levels that are not, that our fertility levels are pretty high by world standards for our income level, but they're not that high. Uh, in such a population, immigration is a godsend. We're getting all these individuals, they've already gone through those difficult early years. You know, it's sort of like if you gave birth to a, a, a well-educated 24-year-old uh, who could take care of you when you're older and was uh, healthy and uh, likable. Um, so, so, in fact, um, the country that is in the worst shape uh, because of all these issues is Japan. So Japan's got doing now a lot of things wrong. Well, they have a very low fertility, they don't have immigration, their economy is tanking, and well, they have people who are living forever, maybe that's good. Uh, but for an economy like that, immigration would actually be a real godsend. So I'm cognizant of the time, and I do have one last question that I would like each of the panelists to respond to. Um, so if there were a third party, the Prosperity and Equality Party, what would or should its political platform be? Uh, I'll go last. <laughs> <laughs> Just everyone choose one plank. The there you go, right. <laughs> well, so, so the, the plank that I would pick would be government investment in things and, more importantly, in people. You have to be more specific. I'm sorry. Yeah. You're going to have Which to be people? more specific for our political platform. You want me to pick something? More, a more, you want a skinnier more plank. <laughs> There's too broad a plank to... Exactly. Um, I think that we should increase our investment in young people, uh, of particularly uh, lower and middle income pe young people, um, by using resources uh, from people who have uh, are higher in the income distribution and have done especially well in the past few decades. I agree entirely, but as a historian, I can look back and I can see enormous disruption with any third party movements. <laughs> so I don't want a third party. I certainly don't want the ones that have been emerging. I would like our current parties to uh, think better and <laughs> to uh, be the party of Doug Elmendorf. Both of them, <laughs> one could be a little more to the right of Doug and one a little more to the left of Doug. That would be a great world. <laughs> the Doug Elmendorf party. Yeah. Well, I, I've worked with Doug, so uh, I, I'm going to sign on to his party. I, that's exactly what I would say, too. I think, to me, that would be the, the, the most important um, thing that we could do, um, just investments in kids who uh, will make our, you know, want to make the country great again. I think, you know, that's how we do it. Yes, I agree. <laughs> there, there's so much to choose from. <laughs> um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take two. <laughs> well, the first one is I would like to have, uh, that I, would, I would like a party that embraced the, as Doug said earlier, the, an esteemed service, uh, both in leadership and education, uh, that recognized, you know, I, I think we live in an era where after 35 years of denigrating public service, we have managed to actually make it uh, uh, somewhat more like the people, uh, the people who initially denigrated it believe. You know, you go into a post office and it doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? Well, because Congress doesn't fund it as punishment for not working well. You know, why, do, why doesn't the IRS answer your phone calls? Well, we've defunded it, so of course you hate the IRS. So uh, I think it's, there's a self-fulfilling prophecy around uh, the quality of governance that needs to be reversed.
the other thing I would add to that uh, that would actually, I think, complement this would be tax simplification. Our, and this, also going to Doug's point, uh, we have so many tax expenditures that are basically hidden handouts, and we could cap them. There's actually a very simple way to address them, just limiting the tax expenditure per individual. You can take it whatever you like. You, you can do it for charity, you can do it for mortgage interest, you can do it for education, but it's only one and a half percent of your adjusted gross income. That would be a, that would be a mind-blowing change. All right, except for Claudia's comment about the wisdom of having a third party, uh, that was very nice. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dean Rouse, and to our panelists.